Hack them once, shame on you. Hack them twice, shame on them. Hack them three times and, well, it's getting ridiculous. The Internet Archive has been breached yet again by the same threat actor. That's twice for them and technically a hacking from a different threat actor in a different time. Today we are facing an unprecedented array of data breaches, hacking attempts, and surges in digital crime. Why is there such a widespread amount and how little is noticed in our everyday lives? Malware, dark sites, brute forcing, zero days, script kiddies, and nation state hackers are all on the rise. Learn more about the threats we face and gain a bit more knowledge than yesterday. Hey everyone, another episode of Exploit Brokers is coming to you now. Hey guys, if you could do me a favor because it would mean the world to me and help the channel out. If you're on YouTube, if you could please smash that like, subscribe, and bell notification icon. If you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcast, if you could please give us a follow and a review, that would help us out tons. With that out of the way, let's get into it. In an article by Bleeping Computer, Internet Archive breached again through stolen access tokens. And before we even jump into the article, what is an access token for some of my viewers or listeners who haven't necessarily come across access tokens before? So an access token is essentially, think of it like a password, but it's not something that you as a user would auto -gen would generate, right? It's not something you're putting password one, two, three, four. An access token is generally some sort of generally encryption based, but it's some kind of token that's generated by a program and it's a long, long string of alphanumeric, generally alphanumeric characters, sometimes with special characters, sometimes not. And that is essentially a way for there to be an authentication, right? It's, it's kind of like a password, but it's auto generated. And generally it's created with the use of some sort of cryptography. And the reason it's done that way is it's a great way to control access because password can be leaked and stuff like that, right? But access tokens, if you have the primary encryption key, you can keep generating new ones that all that all of them could be authenticated with the master encryption, right? That's how stuff like rolling tokens and other stuff can be implemented. But that's just kind of a high level. I'm simplifying it, but that's a high level overview. So let's jump into the article. The Internet Archive was breached again, this time on their Zendesk email support platform after repeated warnings that the threat actors stole exposed GitLab authentication tokens. Since last night, Bleeping Computer has received numerous messages from people who received replies to their old Internet Archive removal requests, warning that the organization had been breached as they did not correctly rotate their stolen authentication tokens. So this is going back to what the underlying tech is, right? If you rotate the tokens, then in theory, you have a new token you can disable or pretty much ignore old tokens because you have new tokens that have been generated and you can use those for authentication. It's not easily guessed, right? If your password is password1234 and you change it to password1235, that could get enumerated and that's a pretty weak password, right? But when you roll and you rotate authentication tokens, you're essentially auto-generating a new token. Well, it seems like they didn't do that, and because they didn't do that, the original breach exposed the keys to the castle, if you will. It's dispiriting to see that even after being made aware of the breaches weeks ago, IA, an Internet Archive, has still not done the due diligence of rotating many of the API keys that were exposed in their GitLab secrets, reads an email from the threat actor. As demonstrated by this message, this includes a Zendesk token with perms to access 800,000 support tickets sent to info at archive.org since 2018. Whether you're trying to ask a general question or, re or requesting the removal of your site from the Wayback Machine, your data is now in the hands of some random guy. If it's not me, it'd be someone else. So when you're talking about GitLab secrets and just GitLab uh, tokens and stuff, the original breach that happened, to the best of my knowledge, they stole source code. Uh, there was a git config that was exposed on the internet. The git config, essentially, when you pulled it down, gave you access to pull all the source code from GitLab. And GitLab is essentially kind of like GitHub. For my, for my listeners, for my viewers, right? Git is a source control system. 
So it's a way for you to have code and you can make changes to it, you can push it, and there's different mechanisms involved with that, but I won't bore you with the details at the moment. But suffice it to say, you have Git and you have GitHub, GitLab, and there's different ways for you to kind of roll your own. Well, because of that, the Git config has enough information in it that it would allow you to authenticate a GitLab. Because you're authenticated, you can pull down the source code. A lot of developers, a lot of programs, and it's it's very bad. It's very bad to do it, but a lot of developers will put stuff in their source code, like tokens, API keys, passwords, and stuff like that. That's a very bad practice. And they were able to take down the source. Now, the API keys, it's saying GitLab secrets. If this is similar to AWS secrets, then AWS secrets is another mechanism that whenever you run in an environment, you're able to request the secrets, in this case, passwords, API keys, from some sort of store that is somewhere. And the benefit to that is that your source code no longer has to contain the hard-coded strings or the API keys, right? You can call a service, authenticate with it via some identity mechanism, whether that's, you know, an IIM role in AWS or one one API key or some kind of a password that's stored somewhere. So that's kind of where you get to, right? There's only so many layers layers of security you can do before eventually you need some kind of identification system that either gets baked in via a pipeline building and deployment or sometimes even in source. And that's where a lot of the issues come from. But suffice it to say, there was a Zendesk token that let them access to it. And the problem with that is Zendesk is their support system. It holds a lot of stuff, uh, everything from the support tickets from removal requests to any identification stuff that was sent over by somebody. And that's actually where some of the article goes into. The email headers in these emails also pass all DKIM, DMARCK or DMARC and SPF authentication checks proving they were sent by an authorized Zendesk server at 192.161.151.10. And ultimately, all that comes down to those are checks that occur to make sure you're not spoofing an email. It's relatively simple and there's even, there's tools, right? There's Linux tools that would allow you to spoof an email. You can make it look like you're sending it from anywhere. But then when you look at the headers and other information, you can tell where it's coming from. Well here, DKIM, DMARC, and SPF are checks that can confirm through certain things like cryptographic signatures and things like that, whether it's coming from the source that it says it is. And in this case, they all passed, which means that the email came from the legit server, which means the server is still under some control of this threat actor. Now, continue forward. After publishing the story, Bleeping Computer was told by a recipient of these emails they had to upload personal identification when requesting a removal of a page from the Wayback Machine. The threat actor may now also have access to these attachments depending on the API access they had to Zendesk and if they used it to download support, tisk, support tickets. These emails come after Bleeping Computer repeatedly tried to warn the Internet Archive that their source code was stolen through a GitLab authentication token that was exposed online for almost two years. So here, I have to take a moment and say kudos to Bleeping Computer for trying to reach out and kind of tell Internet Archive, hey, your stuff's, your stuff's been pwned, your stuff's out there, do something. Because, well, it's, it's kind of hard, right? If a person knows that there's some information, do they have the, call it mental bandwidth, to go track down who to talk to, who to send an email to, because you could always send it to a support, right? But if they're reaching out and they were re repeatedly reaching out from what I'm understanding, then that's good on them. And I'm surprised that GitLab didn't take this more seriously. You have bug bounty programs and you have all of these other mechanisms out there where stuff like this gets reported because the moment this falls into the hands of a bad actor or a threat actor, it could be worse than what this is coming out to. Right now, it seems like the threat actor was doing it for the lulls and for the cred which happens to be a motive that a lot of hackers share, right? Not all hackers are state-sponsored hackers. Not all hackers are in it for the money. There is a significant amount of hackers that are doing it for the lulls and for the cred. And that's just kind of part of the hacker culture, if you will. If we continue forward, 
um, there actually gives some feedback or some context, better said, to the original attack. So on October 9th, Bleep a Computer reported that Internet Archive was hit by two different attacks at once last week. A data breach where the site's users' data for 33 million users was stolen, and a DDoS, or den Distributed Denial of Service attack, by an alleged pro-Palestinian group named SN underscore Black Meta. So a DDoS, or a DOS, is essentially a flood of requests to a server to the point that you overload the server and it can't actually take authentic requests. And a DOS is whenever one computer or one origin does it. And a DDoS is when you have multiple computers, think botnets, and you have multiple computers that are all sending requests at the same time to bring down a server. There is protections you can do, but ultimately, if you have a big enough DDoS, then it becomes harder and harder to mitigate that. Well, that was done by a pro-Palestinian group named SN underscore Black Meta, and there was some initial confusion where it was thought that they were the ones doing the breach, but turns out that was just kind of bad timing on the part of SN Black Meta, because they were doing a DDoS at the same time there was a data breach. The article even kind of goes over that and talks about it, where it says, the misreporting frustrated the threat actor behind the actual data breach who contacted Bleepy Computer through an intermediary to claim credit for the attack and explain how they breached the Internet Archive. The threat actor told Bleepy Computer that the initial breach of Internet Archive started with them finding an exposed GitLab configuration file on one of the organization's development servers, services-hls.dev.archive.org. Now, let me give a bit of color. A lot of organizations, a lot of individuals, a lot of software companies have different environments, right? You can think of the live customer facing stuff as it's known as production. And then you sometimes have staging environments, which is an intermediary between production and then something else known as development servers. A development server is essentially anything where the dev team or QA can sometimes have access to it too. But essentially most of the time developers do it and have access to that. And it's the, think of it like a nightly thing, right? It's the most up-to-date stuff, but sometimes that stuff is broken, right? They're testing stuff out, they're making changes and just seeing how it works, pushing up ideas and stuff like that. It's where they're doing their development. Once that stuff has been confirmed that it works the way the development team, every development team is different in their process, it's just a rough idea. But once development's happy with that, they can push it to staging, and staging would be somewhere where QA could access to it, you know, maybe they route some production traffic over to staging to make sure it works okay. There's A, B deployments and stuff like that. There's different mechanisms in place. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but after staging is production. Well, here, all the stuff that was leaked is on development servers. A lot of the time, you can have the production settings and the development settings on the same code base, right? And when you have it on the same code base, if you somehow get to a development server leak well you're inadvertently also leaking production or if the development server gives you access to all the source code and the source code also happens to have a bunch of other stuff that it gives you access to then that's another way to grab some of that data bleepy computer was also able to confirm that this token has been exposed since at least december 2022 with it rotating multiple times since then so it's been available publicly for quite a while and they've been rotating it but it's been out in the open anyway so what's what's going to happen you'll eventually get a hack and that's what's kind of occurred here that's kind of the, the whole gist of what's going on there's a bit more information here the their claims to have been seven terabytes of data that was stolen and it's pretty much happened for the street cred nothing's sh nothing's been exposed or shown yet but from what it seems like the threat actor was in some kind of group whether that's a Telegram, WhatsApp, I don't know, Messenger, Signal Group, you name it. And they were pretty much just doing it to get the respect of other hackers that were on that. And that's kind of a common thing you see with some lone wolf hackers or small hacker groups, right? They're not doing it for the money. They're not doing it for anything else but the rep, the, you know, the infamy or the fame. And that's kind of where this story kind of ends. I'm really hoping that Internet Archive gets their stuff together. They need to rotate all their stuff like yesterday. Technically, the day of the breach, when they were notified, they should have gone into panic mode and swapped it out. Now, maybe they are. Maybe this was just one of the things they missed. I don't know. 
and I'm really hoping there's some update to this later. If there is, I'll try to touch on it. But ultimately, Internet Archive needs to hopefully step up their game and secure their stuff because it's kind of a shame. I, I know Internet Archive is beloved by a lot of people. I like them and I like what they do and I like their mission. Um, you know, that's that's controversial in some aspects because there's legal and copyright problems with them or whatever. But ultimately what they're doing, I think, is necessary in a lot of regards because it's the Internet and the history of the Internet. You everyone's so obsessed with the idea of the cutting edge that we kind of forget where things came from, right? Being able to see where a website was 10, 20 years ago, five years ago, two years ago is invaluable. You get to see the origins of it. And that's what a lot of the Internet Archive is very useful for. There's other stuff and other things I do, but I won't touch that right now. But guys, I want to thank you for tuning in. I want to thank you for being part of the channel and I'll see you in the next one.